Hi, my name is Mike, and I am here visiting from your friendly neighbor to the north, also known as America's hat, uh, Canada. And in Canada, I live in the national capital, which is Ottawa, where our number one export is WP campus speakers. This is my second time speaking here, and Sean is also a, a fellow Ottawaan. Is that how you say it? Ottawaan? Ottawaan. He's also from Ottawa, and he's spoken at all three word camps. Also, our, export, our chief export after that is good-looking political leaders. <laughs> so I'd like to thank WP Campus for having me back to speak again. And I'd also like to thank them for putting me on directly after Jeremy Felt. It's <laughs> totally an easy act to follow. Um, so a little bit about me. I've been developing. Uh, I've been a developer for about 20 years, and I started using... WordPress in 2007. Um, I've been working for Carleton University for the past six years, except for a weird six month gap where I took a break to work at Acquia, didn't really work out, then I went back. But I'm there now and I am the senior web developer there. And we have a huge network of 600, give or take, uh, single site installs. So a little bit about Carlton, who I guess I, it's been confused a few times now at the conference. People think that I'm talking about Carlton College, which apparently is somewhere in the US. But this is a Carlton in Canada's capital in Ottawa. We have 26,000 students. That's a relatively big university for Canada. I don't know how the numbers compare to the states, but for us, it's big. 4,500 faculty members and staff, teeny tiny web team. Uh, it's me and another guy and one other guy that we just got a year ago. But for the first three or four years, it was just me and another guy. And again, over 600 single site installs. So I spoke in WP Campus 2016, sort of about WordPress in dev, QA, and prod. And I was asked to come back and speak again. And this is sort of an expanded talk um, based on that presentation. But what I'm trying to do here is tell you the story of how we got into this kind of mess <laughs> that we're in, uh, how we fixed it, where we are now, and how we plan on improving it in the future. So how did we get into this mess? In around 2007, that is what WordPress looked like. Version 2.0.9, that is the dashboard, looks very different from what we have today. Um, and we, at, Car at Carleton, we were running this really old content management system called Doc. Yeah, yeah, I see some nods. Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> Nobody wanted to use it, it was awful. And it was about that time that my boss, Danny Brown, got hired at the university and he was a freelance web developer, but he was originally hired as a content editor. So someone who was just supposed to go in to document him, make changes and publish it. Started working there and he was like, uh, no, <laughs> this is terrible. I don't want to use this. And he had some WordPress experience and he decided, went to the powers that be, and I want to start a pilot project where we can use WordPress. If we can convince everyone to use WordPress, we can get away from this crazy, insane, expensive system that everybody hates get something on, get people onto something new that's awesome and free. And there was a bit of hesitation, but they let them go ahead with it. They let them start this pilot project. And I have to say for WordPress 2.0.9, which had what, no, no custom post types, nothing really. It was pretty bare bones back then. Yeah, it barely had pages, that's right. And he did some amazing things. The stuff that he did with WordPress was fairly incredible. There's a problem with that. You have the entire university on this old, crummy CMS, and he posts this pilot project. The word travels quickly. All of a sudden, every single person at the university wants WordPress. Now, when you're running a pilot project and you're trying to you know, prove a proof of concept, what are you gonna do when every single person comes and says, I want that? You're just gonna give it to them. Right, because it's a pilot project, who cares? And it was around that time he started to realize now it's not good, <laughs> made a big mistake. So no multi-site, actually multi-site wasn't even in core in 2.0.9. And honestly, 
I mean, some people may argue me on this, but I think it was probably a little shifty at best at the time. So, and also this was kind of his first WordPress install. Who remembers their first WordPress install? Yeah, was it good? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, but the problem was we had this crazy influx of people who want this new service that we're providing, but we don't really know what we're doing and we just kind of let it get out of control. So no multi-site, nothing. So basically we amassed technical debt equivalent to the national debt of a small country. And then it got worse, if you can believe it. Now I've been, I've been thinking a lot about this. I'm not sure how to present it, but we had someone, I don't want to name any names, who was on our system that I will call the rogue. <laughs> The rogue was not good. So the rogue did a bunch of stuff that you're not supposed to do. He hacked core all the time, but not consistently. So we have 600 sites, or not, not 600 at the time, say 200 at the time sitting on our servers. Some of them had core hacked, some of them didn't. Then he started doing, the, uh, I said he, nuts. Then the rogue started coding. <laughs> doing the same thing to plugins. And then he started putting plugins on sites inconsistently. So some sites had these plugins, some sites had these plugins, some sites had plugins that were hacked, some sites had, some sites had plugins that weren't on any other site. Not a great place to be in. It also, the rogue also, would get requests from other departments and without speaking to anybody, would just make them and put them up there. So we now have to still support that, right? Because this is a service offering that we've provided to our customers at the university and we still have to support that. And it might've been okay if, this, if the rogue was a good coder. Nope. So I'll never forget this. So when I started, one of my first tasks was I need to look through the code, you know, look through the code, familiar, familiarize yourself with the code. And I still have this file, this functions file. I keep it on a Dropbox. Whenever I'm feeling real bad or like I feel stupid that I don't know what I'm doing, I can't solve a problem, I open it and I look at it. So this is the, this is the function. It, I would just like to say that there were 2,100 references in one theme to this function. I was like, what is this doing? Anyone want to guess? Echoing the parameters. What? Echoing the okay. Well, you you guessed correctly. It literally does nothing. <laughs> so I thought I thought like okay maybe it's doing escaping maybe it's maybe it's doing some sort of string translation something nope nothing. So this is around this is about the state that we were in when I was when I was hired. Um, what were the other problems when I was hired? We were doing all updates manually with FTP done by one dude. What's the problem with that? Remember all the hacked core, hacked plugins, hacked everything? You would have to go site by site. He would make a package, upload it. You would have to go and test the site and see if it worked. Nine times out of 10, it didn't work. And then you had to figure out what was wrong and fix it random plugins everywhere, a super simple network architecture. Basically what it was is they had www1 through I think six, I might be wrong on that, one through six and like a 4,000 line redirect file at the top. That's it, no version control. Well, that's a lie. They had uh, dated zipped files, if you, <laughs> if you want to count that. And, and this one guy, I got to give him credit. His name is Troy. He is a fantastic worker and he is like a robot when it comes to this stuff. Five to seven days for him is good. For me, it probably would have taken two weeks to get everything up to date. Not really a state that we want to be in. So I was trying to solve this and I was like, okay, what can I do to fix this? Came up with four things that I think I needed to do to try to improve the situation. And those are these. So one, a better network architecture wanted to fix that WWWX problem, build something that was scalable and maintainable and stable. I wanted to make the updates fast and easy. 
five to seven days, completely ridiculous. I wanted to make all sites portable. And by that, what I, what I mean is I wanted to have a logical development environment. I wanted to have local, dev, QA, prod. And then I also wanted to be able to take any site and move it anywhere else on any of the servers and have it work, just very simply. Because um, a lot of the times, too, we get sites that are being renamed or a site around registration time that'll get super heavy traffic and we want to move that to maybe a better server or a server that's seeing less traffic. We want to be able to do that easy. The other thing was we needed to track all of the information for all of these sites. 600 sites, users, plugins, everything. It's a nightmare to try to find out where one is. You would get a ticket. Oh, this site is 500 -ing. There's a 500 error on this site. Cool. Where's the site? 20 minutes later, you find it. Not good. So we needed, we needed to do something around that. And I just have one point before I start. And actually, as I've been here, I'm a little bit more comfortable talking about this because I've, in some conversations that I've had, I realized that I'm not alone in this. And that sometimes, Real life is not cutting edge. There are presentations I would love to be giving to you right now. I wish I could come in here and say, oh yeah, we fixed this with like an AWS cloud solution. It's got 21 layers of caching and pages are served in like units of plank time or something. <laughs> but that's not true. Or, you know, I fixed it by running WordPress in the blockchain. <laughs> that's... Not something that we did either. So sometimes, especially working at public institutions, you're stuck with the tech that you have. So I'm stuck where I am. We have a dedicated network team. We have network infrastructure that we've bought. We have servers in-house. Um, we have unions that require us to have certain arrangements and working agreements with other departments. We have to use the tech that's available to us. I tried proposing Docker. Nope. I tried proposing all kinds of stuff. Nope. And one of the big problems, too, is that as Canadians, they don't want our stuff on any US servers. And that's a big issue for us because of the Patriot Act. And that opens any information that we put on any US server can be looked at. And I mean, it's not a thing everywhere in Canada. Some places are more liberal than others. But my place, not so liberal. And they also have mass. I was in the news, uh, well, I was in the news in Canada, probably not in the States, but we were massively hacked last year, not through WordPress, through another system, but we basically had someone come in, install ransomware, everyone's computer, all, any of the cloud-based computers all went down. It was awful. And after that, security went, and it was already here. So I just got to this all new level of security. So no external services, nothing. We're stuck with what we have. So I have to figure out the best way to solve this problem given the tools that I have. Hopefully that's okay. Plus, there's that massive technical debt from the rogue, remember him? All that still needs to work. A lot of that stuff doesn't work in those super modern solutions. I wish, anyway, let's move on. <laughs> you get it. So the first thing I wanted to fix was that terrible network infrastructure. And this is essentially what I came up with. And that's what it kind of looks like now. So there is a CDN. That is the one external service that we are allowed to use. That's with Amazon. But we're not allowed to put user uploads on there. So the only thing that we have on our CDN are static resources, uh, CSS, JavaScript, any theme files and images that might be part of the theme, stuff like that. Not allowed to put user uploads. Then we have a reverse proxy. Anyone know what that does? Some people. So for the people that don't, basically the traffic comes in and there's a record on there that says that site lives on this server. It reroutes the traffic and you get that site. So that fixes that www1 through 6 problem. And then I wanted MySQL that could scale. So previously all of those servers just had MySQL running locally. I wanted to move that off of the web servers and just have it be its own thing. And I wanted us to be able to add servers to it as we need. And I'll talk about that a little more later. And then finally, I wanted a staging environment, development environment, a local environment, like a proper workflow, right? Let's get into the, let's get, get up to date here. And then 
So that took a little while, maybe six months or so to get everything working, everything configured. But we still had this massive problem of how do I update this code? How do I update all of these installs? Now, this is a picture of me. <laughs> Looks just like me. It's a picture of me for about three months as I sat there just trying to figure out, like, how am I going to do this? I have no idea. So a lot of Googling, a lot of talking to other people. And what I came up with and what I talked about at the last WP Campus session is we ended up using a service called Deploy HQ. Anyone know it? No? You, yeah, Curtis knows it. Perfect. One guy. <laughs> <laughs> what Deploy HQ is essentially is it was an external service. It took six months to get it approved. Ridiculous. But it was a service that would look at a GitHub repo. And anytime you made a change to that repo, it would SSH into a defined list of servers and upload the files that had changed. Right? When we would run it, basically, we, we used it not like it was designed to be, because who has a setup like this except for us? So we essentially, it, it would fail kind of frequently, just because you're having it do 600 separate servers. That's how we had to set it up. Like each site was a server didn't really work that well. And then came a big disaster when I was like, okay, this is not something that we can use. So on our local environments, we had the repo set up, but we didn't have any uploads, right, in our uploads folder. All that was in that repo was a .git keep file. So somebody went in, I don't even remember who it was, probably me, and just like to clean stuff up. And I was like, ah, oh, you don't need that. And they deleted it. Does anyone know what happens, how Git treats an empty file folder? Yeah. It treats it as like a deletion. So we would frequently, because this script would take, you know, five to seven hours to run. We would frequently run it at the end of the day and have someone go on and make sure everything was cool. Later on that night, you would get a notification that it was done. So I went home, no notification. I was like, why is this taking so long? It doesn't make any sense. Anyway, Deploy HQ was going through every single one of our sites, deleting the uploads folder. <laughs> and we didn't realize it till it was done. So we lost 600 sites worth of uploads. Thankfully, we have backups, but the backups are on tape. The backups take a really long time. Anyway. <laughs> so that, we needed to come up with a better solution. It was around that time that I was also going to the first WP campus. And I met this beautiful man. This amazing, beautiful, and might I add, handsome man. This is Cliff Seal. And he gave a talk on WordPress multi-tenancy. Has anyone ever heard that before? Some people? Good. And I was not the only one wooed by his charms. Aaron is also here. And he is doing a talk tomorrow on how he has applied Cliff's talk to him. And he's going to go and probably do a lot more detail about how multi-tenancy works. I'm just going to give you a, a quick brief overview. Now, I remember I was at lunch at that talk. And I was outside with one of my friends. And I was kind of like scoffing at his talk. I'm sorry, Cliff. <laughs> and I was like, I really don't want to go to this talk. I was like, what is this guy going to do just like do a talk about sim links? Like, this is ridiculous. How is this going to help me? So I went into the talk with this attitude of, oh, sim links. And when I left the talk, I was like, woo, sim links. <laughs> <laughs> and this was my, so this became the solution that I was going to use. But so what is multi-tenancy? OK, straight from Google, copy and paste. The term software multi-tenancy refers to a software architecture in which a single instance of software runs on a server and serves multiple tenants. A tenant is a group of users who share a common access with specific privileges to the software instance. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I don't quite get it. How does that apply to WordPress? So essentially, this is how multi-tenancy works. You're creating symbolic links. Does anyone know what a, does everyone know what a symlink is? I'll just, I'll explain it anyway. I should, probably should. So a symlink is 
also sometimes called a soft link. And it's a special pointer or file or directory, kind of like a shortcut in Windows or like an alias on Mac. And unlike a hard link, a symbolic link doesn't contain any data. It's just like a reference to something else. So what does that mean for WordPress? What that means is I can take the WordPress files, WordPress as a whole, the core files, I can put them at the root of the server. I can put all my themes at the root of the server. I can put my plugins at the root of the server or anywhere, it doesn't have to be the root of the server. And then within each install, I can tell that instance that this is where those files are. So what that means per server is that if I update my themes, my plugins, and my WordPress version, all in those red buckets, every single site on that server gets the updates. Genius. Perfect. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. So what would an install look like? Or what do our installs look like? They look kind of like this. Or ideally, they would look kind of like this, but they don't. <laughs> So each install has an index file. That index file looks very much like the one that you get in the WordPress package that you would download, sort of, with a couple of changes. Go to Aaron's talk, he'll explain it to you. There's a config file, and for us, the config file is anything that is specific about that site. So database name, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anything specific to that site is in that config file. A symlink to WordPress, a symlink to themes, a symlink to plugins, all somewhere else on the server. I wish it was that simple, but remember the rogue. <laughs> and it did not quite work out like that for me, but I did get it to work. And here is my network graph of my very first multi-tenancy setup. Oh boy. <laughs> it's not great. Super complicated, but it did work. <laughs> which is great. And one of our goals now, as we move forward, is to simplify this stuff. So we're cleaning out that old code that doesn't need to be there, but it goes slow. We're a small web team, we have a lot of projects. We're consolidating themes, trying to ultimately get to one master theme that we can update, that everything uses, but it's going slowly. But it does work, and it does get simpler as we move forward. If you want a better example of it's simplicity in action, go to Aaron's talk. <laughs> um, so how do we update the code now? I, it's, you know, honestly, I don't think it's the best solution, but right now, uh, for lack of time, on each server, we're just running Composer. Uh, everyone know what that is? So com for those who don't, Composer is a dependency manager. And a dependency manager is a tool that sort of allows you to define all of the libraries and packages that you want to use and the version that they're using. And then you can just run one command, it goes out to all the different places, gets them and downloads them. Um, there's a great article from the guys at Roots about using Composer with WordPress. I don't wanna go too far into it because you could just talk about it a ton on its own. It's probably a talk on its own. But that's currently what we're doing. Ideally in the future, I kind of wanna move to maybe Composer locally with some sort of continuous integration that deploys those changes out to the servers with testing, et cetera. But right now, it works. So the next thing that I wanted to fix was our MySQL. And this kind of goes into the portable sites thing a little bit as well. And this is what I did with our MySQL. So I set up replicating MySQL. Anyone know what that is? No? Well, maybe some. So the way that re replicating MySQL works is that that little red bucket that you see there, any write request to the database always goes to that server. As soon as that write request is made, it replicates those changes out to the other MySQL instances that you have. And what you can do with that then is you can have your production replicate down to staging to development. So it's just there may not necessarily be using it, but you can have anything that you have in production also in your other environments. And that makes moving sites between those environments super easy. Uh, it's not that hard to set up. Um, you, you probably need to speak to a MySQL expert that actually sets up the replication. But once you have that in place, it's not hard. We just use a simple plugin. We use, it's called LudicrousDB. Um, 
we used to use HyperDB, which is an automatic plugin. I believe they use it on .com. Uh, I'm not sure if they still do, uh, but it's not PHP 7 compatible. So we switched to um, Ludicrous DB, but it's super easy. Basically, it's a plugin that you put in. You get this DB config file that's a drop in plugin. And you can just add as many databases to you, as many da databases as you want. And you just have to pass it an array of host, user, password, database name. Ah, the smart quotes. Sean, we missed one. <laughs> <laughs> the database name. And then you define whether you want it to be a reader or a writer. So essentially, what that does is as your requests come in, it, lo it just kind of, it acts as sort of like a makeshift load balancer, and it splits those read requests among all of the servers that you have. So it's just kind of like it's splitting those requests up, and if, so if you're getting overloaded, you can just add another server. And it works exceedingly well. Um, the, and that kind of ties into our portable sites. And what I really wanted to do here was I wanted to move any site anywhere and have it work. Essentially, I wanted to move the config file and that's it anywhere else and have it work. And we managed to do that with a tiny bit of code. Um, so one of the big pain in the butts in WordPress is hard-coded URLs in the database, URLs stored in serialized strings in the database. That stuff sucks. And this is just a simple function. And there's an article written by Scott Taylor. And it's old, 2012, but it still works about running WordPress in dev, prod, and QA. Um, and basically what this does, what you see at the top there is something that we would have in that config file where each URL is defined as a constant, production, staging, dev, local. And then the bottom part is more in like a more global WP config file that every site looks at. And what it does is it just runs this output buffering function that looks at the page and before the page is returned to the browser, it looks at everything on that page and replaces any URL with the URL that you are on. Make sense? Sort of? It's not performant code. But you'll notice that it's only running if you are not in production. So really not a big deal. But that means with this code, you can just move a site. You don't have to worry about doing any URL replacement in the database. Awesome. Next thing is how do you handle differences for, for each environment? So on staging, we want different options than we want on dev and, or what we want locally. So our defaults are set at the top for production. We don't, want debug, we don't want debug on on production. We don't want the log on. We want cache enabled and we want our Redis running. And then we change those based on if you're in a different environment. So now I don't have to change any configuration or any configuration option about caching or debugging or whatever. And you can use this to add whatever options you want. And now I don't need to change anything when I'm moving stuff in between environments. The next one is databases. How do I handle it connecting to a different databases? To different databases, sorry. And the first part of it, very much the same thing. That would be in the config file. And we would define all of the different environments. Here I've just shown prod but they're a constant set for each one. And then you use a similar type script that you're just figuring out where you are. Are you on staging? Are you on, are you on dev? Are you on local? And then it just includes the P just like that and has the constants for the environment that you're on. So now when I move that config file, I don't have to do anything. It just works. And that was the ultimate goal. And then the big one that was a big pain in the, in the butt for me was the HT access. Because we have sites that are like not just at the top level, but like multiple levels down. And that sucks because there's path information in that HT access. So after a lot of work, we came up with this. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I had a lot of help with this. So if there's any HT access experts here that can look at this and figure out something better, I would love to talk to you. But basically, this HT access will work for WordPress wherever your WordPress install is. You don't need to define a path. And it's just using environment variables on the server to do that. But it works great. So now I don't have anything that is specific to any environment. I don't have anything specific, or, or I have everything that is specific, and it gets dynamically switched based on what URL you're currently looking at. So now all of the sites get updated equally and fast. 
And when we run Composer now, what's our update time using multi-tenancy? About 20 seconds per server, which is pretty good. Uh, it's a lot better than five to seven days, I'll tell you that. Um, I would really like to get that higher, or so higher, that's the wrong one. I would really like to get that lower. And I think with continuous integration, I think that's something that we could do. If, if all the files are just transferred automatically, you don't have to SSH in and run any commands, it just happens, it'd be even quicker than that. So that's where we are today. The next thing that we needed to do was track all the installs. And to do that, I did a very basic plugin that we do plan on releasing, uh, just needs a little bit of work first, should be out soon, but it's a site manager tool. And essentially all it does is it collects information about the site and writes it to a database somewhere, right? And then it puts everything in its own tables and rows, so then I can write queries against that to pull down information about sites, where they are, where they are installed. And you just see that there's an example from our site, we add like a, a little thing to the admin bar where we can update the site data manually or just link right to that entry in the site manager. And when we go into that site manager, you see uh, there's a bunch of stuff redacted for security reasons, but there's, you see all the different information about the sites. So you see the version, the path, the database name, the theme it's running, the time zone. I know that's weird, but we had some issues with time zones for a while. Uh, the plugins that it's running, the MU plugins that it's running are 80 groups that have access to it and all of the users that are on the site. Now, all of that is in a database that is indexed properly, searchable, easy to find. We often use this too in bash scripting. So sometimes when we need to run, say there's a change we need to run on every site, we can make a MySQL query in a bash script, get back the list of sites for a particular server and just loop through sites. And you know, sometimes we'll run WPCLI commands on that or um, if we need to add files or move files. And that's, it, it's kind of like a makeshift way of managing the 600 different installs. But it does work, and I do want to improve upon it. Um, so what's next for us? Uh, more symlinks. <laughs> no, no, just less symlinks. So really what I want to do is I want to simplify multi-tenancy. I really want to get it down to a point where it is just that basic. It doesn't look like that insane network graph I showed you. I just want it to be way simpler. I want to get continuous integration working so we update locally, the code goes automatically out to the server. We're also working on something called the Ravens design system. And it's something that we do plan on open sourcing. And essentially what it is, is it's like a platform agnostic package of, it's like, kind of like Bootstrap, but it's like a CSS JavaScript library, but with like pre-made templates and blocks that are all pre-built, all WCAG accessible, et cetera, et cetera. But we want to use that to rebuild all of our sites. And as those sites get rebuilt one by one by one, we're going to get rid of that legacy code. We're going to get rid of that technical debt. We're going to merge things into one cohesive system. And all of my pain will hopefully be over. <laughs> and that's it. So thank you very much.